Before we talk about why people love cloud services, let's talk about first why some people would hesitate in using cloud services. One reason is performance guarantee tends to be weaker than what you can get from dedicated facility. And this is a common thread of debate we have encountered many times already and will encounter a couple of more times in this course. Back in lecture one, we talked about orthogonal versus uh, non-orthogonal as an example of uh, the tension between uh, dedicated versus shared resource allocation. Just like uh, packet switching versus uh, circuit versus packet switching, Cloud services in a rented cloud, okay, part of it, versus getting a dedicated set of servers and the storage and switches for yourself, clearly the performance guarantee tend to be weaker in the former. And this is just like the difference between riding a bus versus riding a taxi. It is cheaper to ride a bus, but uh, you do not have uh, the kind of comfort or performance guarantee that you would enjoy in riding a taxi. And yet, perhaps the biggest reason that people hesitate uh, in using cloud services, at least for some performance uh, insensitive kind of application, is the fact that the cloud may even be uh, unavailable or not so reliable. Okay, there can be outage for example, in April 2011, uh, a three to four day outage uh, of uh, part of Amazon's cloud services. And also in June 2012, uh, Netflix, which you can view as a kind of cloud video services, as we will see in a couple of more lectures time. So when people look at this choice and they say, well, if I don't even have a good guarantee on the availability of the service, I may hesitate. Okay. So there are a variety of ways you can deal with this, one of which is to spread your uh, service traffic demand across multiple cloud providers and multiple regions of the same cloud provider. That will help enhance the availability for you. Now, what about the reasons why people want to use cloud services, uh, meaning a rented cloud? Well, for the cloud users, the main advantage is resource pooling. Okay. First of all, you may only need a little slice of resources. Okay. Second, you may have fluctuations in the exact amount that you demand. So if you have to do a, a dedicated resource allocation, you have to build your own facility, then you have to look at this fluctuation over time and pick the peak. Okay. So both for those that only require a little slice, as well as those uh, whose requirements fluctuate over time a lot, they would like to say, maybe I can pool my resource demands with uh, those of other users. And this is often called the capex to opex conversion. Capex refers to capital expenditure. Opex refers to operation expenditure. Okay, these are, these are for example, expenditure associated with buying a server. Okay, this uh, is the expense associated with paying Amazon on a monthly basis for the rented resources from its cloud. So for cloud users, the choice is going from a capital expenditure, okay, how would you, uh, how much do you need to buy in order to have the dedicated facility, going into uh, turning that into operation expenses. Okay, so capex opex conversion. Then what about the cloud providers? What's in it for them, for Amazons of the world? One big reason that they participate in this ecosystem is the economy of scale. Scale has been a key word in the last few lectures and today's lecture too. The economy of scale is reflected in two ways. First, on the 
uh, side of procurement. You got to buy all these hardwares. So uh, as a large cloud provider, you can have a deeply discounted price for servers, deeply discounted price for switches, for labor even, and for land, for electricity and cooling, which tend to be uh, dominant drivers of the operational expenses for running a data center. It consumes a lot of electricity, and sometimes uh, the heat is so much that the cooling expense becomes the majority of the overall operation expense. So all these things take a lot of money, and if you have a large scale, you can buy it in bulk and receive major discounts. Another reflection of economy of scale is on the other side, facing the consumers, your customers, and you can run statistical multiplexing. And we saw this back in the homework of lecture 13, and now we're going to see it again. It's very similar to the principle of aggregating traffic across the layers of the network, or different from access to metro to core uh, network, as we saw in lecture uh, 10, actually. Okay. So this is the typical picture of statistical multiplexing. You've got, say, three users, and their traffic goes up and down over time. And then if you add them together, however, you see a smoother uh, or a narrower dynamic range of the traffic demand over time. Okay. And this is the magic of adding many uh, different traffic profiles together. Now, of course, you can also say maybe they peak all at the same time. Okay, That may be a popular hour of the day then you're going to see a big peak here no matter what in the aggregated form. In that case, the statistical multiplexing gain, the gain associated with one user peaking, the other user not using the network will be not available. Then you may have to resort to techniques such as time-dependent pricing to shift some of that peak off to the valley. So this is all about scale. Without scale, there is no economy of scale on either the supply or the demand side of the cloud provider's business. So the question is, how can we scale it up? In fact, is scaling up even feasible? Now, we talked about 500,000 servers that we need to connect them. Okay. So how do we connect them? connect them as a mesh, too many links connected to the tree. Maybe we'll see what's the problem with that in a minute. In fact, if you recall back to lecture 10, we already saw that high throughput connectivity for each node does not scale beyond a certain point. Just like you cannot make a router too big while maintaining high performance per node uh, or per degree. Okay. Same thing, you cannot make a very fast and very large switch inside a data center network to connect all these half a million of these servers. So our challenge now is to f figure out a way to achieve advantage of scale for the whole network without suffering the limitation of scale on each node. Each node may be hard to scale, and yet we want the all network to scale. How could that be? Well, maybe a tree. Now we saw a tree back in lecture uh, on the small world nine. Okay, we saw a tree back in last lecture fifteen about um, P two P. Okay, in fact, we see uh, multi tree okay, in P two P. Now, what about a tree here? All right, suppose we build a tree. For example, uh, you got eight servers, and then you connect all these servers through a tree, okay? The circles are the leaf nodes in the tree and they are the servers. And then the rectangles are the switches. So similar to the model that we saw for algorithmic small world in lecture nine. Now these switches are not too bad, okay? They connect these two and then they need to uh, go up, okay, assuming each pipe here is of a fixed unit capacity, I need two links to go up, right, and these two also need to go up, 
So each of these switches is actually a two by two switch. Okay. Two coming in, two going out. And then these become four by four switch. And then the root node in this case is a big switch, is a uh, eight by eight. Okay. You see it like four by four is actually eight coming in, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But then they also need to come out. So when they come out, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So if you want to talk to uh, that server, okay, then you have to go through this switch, then go through this switch, go through this switch, come down this switch, come down this switch, and go over there. So while these switches, this row, might be easy to build, this gets increasingly harder, and this gets even harder. So here's the problem of uh, running this connectivity inside data center through a tree. Okay, if these links are let's say uh, one gigabit per second Ethernet, okay, because we're talking about a, a smaller physical span, they're all within the building rather than across the whole country of the world. Let's say the speed can go up to one gigabit per second. That's fine. Okay, then soon you're going to uh, go up to ten gigabit per second. And then you need a very large switch. This is still a small example because there are only eight servers. Imagine going from eight to 500,000, okay? So you're going to need a huge root switch, each port being 10 gigabit per second. That's a lot. And in fact, you cannot really build such a switch. So what people do is to pretend that these nodes would not be peaking at the same time, okay? No peaking at the same time. And therefore, even though there might be two or, or eight uh, lines coming in, I do not provide eight gigabit per second. I provide, say, only still one gigabit per second, okay? My hope is that if one of these servers need one gigabit per second, the other seven servers would not uh, need any capacity. So this is an oversubscription. It's like sometimes what happens when airlines um, become too aggressive in selling uh, tickets and they actually oversubscribe. They sold more tickets than their seats and then at the gate they will ask you whoever want to get 300 bucks or 600 bucks and wait for the next flight. Okay. Now what would happen if actually people demand indeed peak at the same time and you got many subscription factor then you actually will have a big congestion so how big is the over subscription factor in today's large data center if you run this kind of tree architecture then you need something like a factor of 200 over subscription so only if you know half of these uh, servers peak at the same time then you already have a 100 factor of congestion now we won't have time to talk about scheduling congestion control in a data center but even those cannot deal with such a huge congestion so building a tree is not going to work what about building multiple trees well the idea of building multiple trees work for p2p because the uh, non-leaf nodes like these kind of nodes are also peers and you can swap them into leaf nodes put some leaf nodes uh, up uh, closer to the root in another tree okay. but in this case these are actually switches but these are the servers with CPU and memory and so on so uh, you cannot put them in the road of a ser uh, of a switch and put the switch in the road of a server so multi-tree won't work in this case either now what? How can we build large network? Well, an idea that is perhaps shocking when you first hear is that you can actually build large networks from small switches, just like you can build a reliable network from unreliable components.